as somebody who has been demonized and falsely portrayed and cartoonified almost endlessly for the last six years, I resonate with the idea that one approach is to try and put enough pieces of what you actually are in public that it becomes almost impossible to portray you as anything other than you actually are. Mm. In other words, if you're comfortable with a warts and all presentation of yourself, one way to immunize yourself from mm. some of it is to be more complete than you would like to be, mm. right? Mm. And I have noticed that the next phase in that arms race is a concerted effort to get people to feel icky for giving you a chance, right? In other words, there's an army of sock puppets mm. that erupts in the replies to anything I do. And its purpose is to create the impression that I have been discredited and that anybody who doesn't see through the obvious bullshit that I am putting into the world is themselves revealing their own mental deficiency, mm. right? Now, this is nonsense. But the point is, if you didn't know who I was and you encountered that, you might think, oh, God, I don't see through him. Maybe that means I'm being a fool. And the point is, that's such an annoying thing to have to wrestle with that I'm sure large numbers of people walk away at that moment. It's not that they accept the portrayal. It's that they mm. accept that they do not know what to think and they don't want to take the risk of being revealed as foolish. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, the, um, there is an arms race, but I do think the the unusually complete and maybe unfortunately complete picture that some of us put into the world is a defense against being caricatured. Mm. And that might be very much a description of what James is doing. That, that's, that's, that's interesting because the people with audiences who have traveled with them a long time tend to have a force field around them. Um, there's, there is an attempt often aided by the, the mainstream media to cartoonify someone and then critique them into the ground with cynical critiques and gather the warts and not leave the all and just gather the warts and present them and create this, this effigy that people will then go ahead and burn, this digital effigy. Um, and the, the, the kind of, how, do you, how, do you, how, how would you say, the inoculation, is, as you put it, is having an audience that has been with you through some shit and so um, who will stand up for you in, t in, in these times um, when, when people come after you. It is, it is. It's like an arms race of building identities and influence and then taking those identities down. And both, both of them employ a kind of cartoonifying or, or you know, persona building. Um, yeah, I, I find I find this this line of uh, conversation very very interesting because I think it's the main theme in the film. But from a from a from a from, I didn't know I was doing it with the characters that much. I just kind of did it. But it's kind of how I see the world. I see the the mainstream media as a cartoonification of reality, and a lot of I find a lot of my work is just trying to complicate it. You <laughs> just kill it by complicating it um, because that's the way the world is, and so. I did. I did think is uh, in in the, the last episode when we when we released the project, the the goal was to use influential people just to get the maximum amount of information out there about the project and what was happening and what we found and so on and so forth. And I thought that that kind of flash flood of information would make it very hard to construct the project into something that was easily taken down. And so I, I think that there's there's this kind of there's this kind of mass communication strategy that can take place in these things. And I did I, I often think about how individuals are cartoonified on the internet and how I I, I I don't see them as cartoons. And so it's hard for me to 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 string someone up you know, who's who's being shamed or something like that because I just don't see them as the effigy that's getting burnt. But um, yeah, it it is. I like it when people watch my films and then deliver something back to me that might be going on in them. Well, I, you know, I mean, obviously this is a, a fascinating topic to me for reasons that are very personal. Um, but the, I have had the experience 
many, many times, especially over the last six years, of encountering somebody who I had what I thought was a pretty complete picture from their public presentation. And then I encounter them in personal space, and they are very different than I had imagined. Very different. And I then watch this happen to people with me, right? People who have gotten some impression, and then we meet interpersonally, and it, in some cases, rocks their world because it reveals how false an impression can be if you're standing mm. in the wrong spot. Mm. And so, you know, again, I don't want to torture you as an artist. I don't want to torture you by trying to stick the label next to the piece <laughs> that you've put on the wall of the gallery. But I am fascinated by what it is and how it works. And one thing I see you doing, you are, you make no bones about the fact in your film or anywhere else that you like the subjects that you are documenting. And that means that you document their warts out of affection and not out of mouth. Yeah, they're not warts to me. They're they're endearing aspects, endearing vulnerabilities. Maybe I I I, I, right. I like that. I like but that more. You, if I was in, if I was in the presence of a perfect person, I don't think I'd like them. No, you'd hate them. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. but the, but I guess my point is, look, but not out of envy, people, just out of your boring. But anyway, go on. Most people are not in a position to meet James Lindsay. And the presentation that he gives online makes many of us uncomfortable, I think, right? There's stuff there that I just wish he wouldn't do. Yeah. And what you are doing is in some sense providing a friend level view of the human being that is a wonderful corrective for the, um, the aggressive, the <laughs> yeah, for the monster. Um, and so anyway, again, I do think that that's kind of a, a, um, a gamble, but I don't also, I also don't think that anyone is good at presenting themselves on the internet. I think that there is some, I don't think anyone is good at presenting themselves full stop. That's where you get these yep. body dysmorphia things. It's, you don't, right. you really don't know how you look to the outside world. And, you know, Jung, most of Jungian psychology, which I find very interesting, is to try and try and figure out what parts of yourself you don't see so you can come into, into alignment with them. Um, but we, we, don't, we won't go <laughs> too far down that mad rabbit hole. But um, I think that something's taking place on the internet where we're forced to consciously construct a persona. And I think, I think it's driving people mad. I think that a lot of, a lot of people... Think about think about an identity in a town with no, with no, where internet hasn't hasn't come into play. You're in a small rural town where I am now. Actually, you're in Germany in a farming town. Your identity is is built in concert with the people around you, and it's usually yep. something that you're doing. Identity is done, not presented. And so, you know, you might, you might wear some weird clothes or you play with it, especially when you're a teenager, but that's kind of like a, a, an awkward phase you go through where you're trying to construct what the world sees of you. Most people just kind of, oh, I think healthy people, um, well-rounded people just, just do their identity into adulthood. And now we're forced to construct your persona digitally and it's, it's very, it's also very hard to see people receive your persona in a way that you don't want them to, to, to receive it as well. And so there's a lot of pathologies around wanting to control the way that people see you. Um, and, and other people are trying to control the way people see you for their own purposes. And so there's this, there's this kind of mad, um, mad persona building and destroying process that's taking place and it's also making people build their morality you know it's someone who's too online there's a kind of like digital super ego that that people are around trying to construct and i think that, that these grievance studies people are trying to create this this um this this construct in order to literally um sorry yeah i, I guess literally in a way program the personalities of the world to to their activist ends, and so there there is this kind of construction of a <laughs> these these super egos are going to war on the internet, trying to build the people on the outside. And the, if you're too online, you are going to be 
head into into all kinds of pathologies when you're when you're when you're playing with that. And I, I think that that's 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 something. It's very interesting. It's very interesting being here in um, in Germany, where I, I know the language enough to get by, but I don't know it very well. So I get to avoid all the bullshit and just interact with people. And interact with. I really love love being in a place like this because we don't abstract too far into nothingness. We're just there together and being. And these people, these people don't really mess with the internet. The next generation is for sure, but um, they're all farmers and doers and well rounded kind of people. And I really, I really, really like it here. All right, that was a rant. The, no, that was the nugget. That was the thing that I was torturing you to get you to say because okay. it's it's incredibly deep and important and actually it dovetails with something that heather frequently talks about it's not only the artifice that arises out of the online presentation and one's ability to curate it in a way that is unnatural but it is also the durability of past versions of it right in other words you are supposed to go through that awkward phase as a teenager where you get to figure out who you are and you are not supposed to be dogged for the rest of your life by a snapshot from it, mm, mm. right? That is not something you're supposed to be permanently stuck with. It is something that is supposed to decay in the memories of those mm. who knew you at the time and becomes unimportant. Mm. And so I do think there is a kind of insanity that arises out of the ability to curate your own image and actually the ability I to curate it. other people's you know, there's that awkward moment it's, the teenager has the, that disappears but think about someone that doesn't like you they're probably doing this mentally they're aggregating all, all your slip-ups um, exactly. and now that now they can do it in a, in a in a more i think it's it's digital but it's still physical they do it in a physical way they're ag aggregating all of your slip-ups and then, and then ca casting their version of you out there, often in some kind of political assassination uh, attempt. Not even, not even slip-ups. Um, Re Reframes, ticks, yeah. Ticks, ways that you phrase things, words that you use too frequently, right? Mm. All of these things are vulnerabilities because – and here, here's one of the punchlines from my perspective – I think the insanity that you are diagnosing actually goes back to the invention of the, the proper mirror. Before there, were, before there was flat glass and a silver coating that made an accurate mirror, there were polished pieces of metal that gave you an impression of how you might look, but it wasn't highly reliable because they weren't really that flat. Um, the closer you get to being able to regard yourself as someone else sees you, the greater mm. the temptation mm. to try to alter what they see, mm. right? There's a positive feedback that kicks in. If your only understanding of how you looked to other people was how they reacted to you, it would cause you, you know, if you did something one day and it caused people not to interact with you very well or not to look you in the eye or whatever, you might not know why you didn't feel so great about what you did that day, but you would over time adjust your presentation so that it resulted in people interacting with you in the way that was best, right? So you might in fact end up accidentally, you know, you ever meet somebody and they're not classically attractive but they are undeniably attractive the way they carry mm. themselves mm. is yeah. appealing yeah. and you just think i like this person i like to be around this person right mm. um that that genuineness would encompass a much wider range of phenotypes than this artificial situation. I mean, it's become hyper artificial in the modern mm. world, mm. but the ability to know what you look like, the ability to modify what you look like, the ability to um, surgically alter what you look like, the ability to cultivate that which you present online, and now the ability to use uh, filters and other kinds of mm. tech, including artificial intelligence to present something that's preternaturally one way or the other. These things are 
definitely driving us crazy. 